Hey, we're going to talk about uh, pest management in the uh, turf grass today. Uh, I'll start by saying I'm not an expert in this. Uh, my expertise is more in soil chemistry and nutrition, but but you can't uh, you can't deal with turf grass without talking about these pests and pathogens. So uh, let's um, let's uh, do this. Um, let me uh, share my screen with you and show you this. Uh, presentation that I've got put together. It's just riveting. You're going to love it. Uh, first of all, let's uh, talk about these things. Uh, you know, one of these, one of the pests we, you know, we deal with is weeds. And, and I think the most important thing, this really goes for all of them, is that if, if we manage our turf well, uh, we're less likely to have negative impacts from pests and pathogens. It, it's similar to our bodies. If you're if we're healthy, we're more likely to not get sick, and if we do get sick, to survive it. Um, you know, folks with you know cancer are more likely to succumb to pneumonia, for example. It, it's very similar with grass. If, if I'm not healthy, otherwise, I'm more likely to succumb to these kinds of things. So, in terms of weed control, uh, that's our best strategy and, and true with other things too and to a degree uh, we, we want to select you know proper uh, species and cultivars the, the right mowing height is really important um, if I mow too short uh, I, I get more weeds now sometimes we're intentionally doing that because we're sports fields golf and we're intentionally mowing short but one of the downsides of doing so is that we have more weed pressure uh, using correct fertilizer, uh, timing and rates is really important. Talk about that in different videos. Um, <clears throat> uh, it, it's particularly important not to overdo the phosphorus. Uh, that, that can actually favor some of the weeds. And then, of course, uh, irrigating properly and other good management techniques as well. Um, it's also important when I'm getting ready to establish turf or overseed that I don't put down weed seeds. So I want to make sure that when I'm buying my seed and sod that it's it's basically weed free. Um, it, it's important that we aren't compacted. It was one of the biggest problems in heavy trafficked areas. Compaction tends to favor the weeds over the, the uh, uh, turf grasses that are desirable. Uh, it's especially true, not weed loves compacted soils or at least it uh, takes advantage of them. Same thing with annual bluegrass. Um, we, we, it's important that we do uh, timing uh, correctly for aeration. Uh, with a pre-emergent herbicide, because what can happen is, is as we aerate, we, we pull up those cores of soil, they can have weed seeds down inside, and you're bringing those up to the surface and basically making it favorable for them to germinate. Um, we, we typically would like to say we do aeration in early fall. Uh, the problem, though, is if I have an annual bluegrass problem, that's not the best timing for that. Uh, now, in some cases, we need to aerate far more than once a year. And so, you know, that just, just a good thing to know, you know, when possible to use that as a tool. Uh, as a last resort, we do herbicides. Um, and frankly, we typically have to do that. Uh, again, the well-managed turf, my, my yard, um, I don't have a lot of weed problems. I tend to spot spray rather than spraying the whole thing because I basically got my weeds under control. If I get the rare dandelion that shows up, I'll just go out there and spot treat it. Uh, it, it, I think that's a great uh, way. It's it, a little difficult to do that with commercial applications, um, but I, I think it's in principle is a better system. Uh, I think it's important to know and understand these weed life cycles. Uh, if, if you're, it's easier to control them when they're small uh, than when they are well established. We also need to understand uh, how weeds germinate and grow. Uh, just some. You know, some common turf weeds. Uh, here are some things that we see. Uh, everybody's seen dandelions. Uh, clover tends to be really uh, common. Uh, crabgrass, very common. Uh, in sports turf, again, uh, is golf. Uh, annual bluegrass is really a serious problem. I, I, there's no way, I'm not going to cover all the weeds. It's just, it's, for one thing, it's pretty variable by area. And so it's important just to you know figure out what what are your biggest problems in, in your area, and then um, you can work with local experts to solve those problems. Again, annual bluegrass I think this deserves a kind of a special recognition here because um, it, it just really is a, a bit of a problem. Um, you know, so like here's this this is a BYU's uh, Lavelle Edwards Stadium field. Uh, I got involved in this field and back in 2008, I took this picture. You can see these brown spots. 
Uh, I had actually recommended to the athletic department uh, that they need to replace it. I, I felt like we had about a 40% infestation of annual bluegrass on this field. And about 10 days or so before the first game, uh, that annual bluegrass went dormant. You can see all these brown spots. It was just a really hot August and conditions were just right that the bluegrass decided to go dormant and, and be brown during the game. So <clears throat> it can really be a problem. Um, I, not only is it unsightly, they, they look yellow. I'll show you a picture of that here in a second. But, you know, when they're not brown, they're yellow. Um, but it's also, it, it just, it's not a good surface, you know, especially for like football or, or other sports where we need good stability. Uh, these things are not uh, stoloniferous or rhizoma rhizominous. Uh, so like, for example, bluegrass, Kentucky bluegrass um, forms rhizomes that kind of help knit it together. Uh, this is a bunch grass, um, and so it doesn't knit together very well. Plus, its roots are pretty short. Bottom line is, we get some poor stability. Here's a here's a picture, one of my favorite pictures. You can see the chunks of turf grass flying up with Austin Collie on this catch. Uh, just not a, not a great surface to play on. Uh, in addition to being unsightly, like I mentioned here, this is typically what we see. This is a football field, but you go into any any golf course, any sports field that's been there for a while. And this is what you're going to see because this annual bluegrass is going to find its way in there. You'll kind of notice that uh, uh, sometimes like this particular manager is bringing in whenever he has a, a little thing of annual bluegrass show up, he was bringing in divots, um, uh, cutting them out of the sod farm and bring them in. But you'll notice that, yeah, it worked great, except for that it forms this little halo of annual bluegrass around. This stuff is just so prolific. It just takes off. Here's a little closer up shot. Here's an even closer up shot. One of the problems with them is, is that it'll form these seat heads. And those seat heads will form even if you're mowing every day at, at a tenth of an inch on a golf green. Uh, they're, just, they're just incredibly adept to surviving low mowing and putting out these seat heads. Of course, you know, especially in golf, we, the, it really, the seat heads are a problem for the balls rolling. It, it causes problems and golfers hate that. So, so again, unsightly, not very, very effective. Uh, there are some things to some chemicals uh, with, you know, that we can use to control. Uh, sometimes, though, they, they ca cause a problem. Here's one trial we did where one particular herbicide uh, just didn't do well in our environment. And of course, that doesn't always happen. Um, it just so happens that that we had kind of a fail on, on this particular one, it just didn't do well. Uh, this other one actually did decent. It, it just doesn't completely control the, the annual bluegrass, but you know there are some things that are uh, available. Now, one thing I will mention though, is that the more traffic you have, uh, you can get some damage from these chemicals. So, so I, I don't, I'm not steering people away from using the herbicides for annual bluegrass, I, but I, I do, provide a note of caution that we sometimes have run into trouble with. Them. And so you need to be careful and make sure you're working with folks who know what they're doing with dealers and, and uh, make sure you, your situation is going to work well. Okay. Again, healthy turf is the best control. Uh, pest pathogen problems are, are somewhat rare, becoming more common, especially in the West. Um, uh, the more human environments, they're, they're, they've typically been a bigger issue, but um, you know, I, I don't run into a lot of problems outside of sports turf and golf with with pathogens. Uh, a lot of times, uh, we just don't see big problems. I never applied a fungicide on my home until last year. But, you know, so I, w I went decades without having any problems, and then it found its way in, and now I'm kind of stuck with it, and I have to treat every year now. Um, again, high traffic, low mowing heights make us more susceptible to pathogens. And so uh, on golf courses and on sports fields, uh, we're treating pretty regularly and have to. Uh, we, we're concerned about resistance that occurs with repeated use of some of the same chemicals is particularly an issue with weeds, uh, but it can also be an issue with insects and, and other uh, with pathogens. Uh, it's important to use custom chemical application with different chemicals. Um, with a different mode of action in order to try to manage that resistance and prevent it from happening. Uh, the famous example is, is dandelions. You know, 2,4-D came along and it was this kind of miracle herbicide and everybody applied it all across the country. And the problem was the dandelions, you know, we had some mutations and, you know, found some dandelions that were kind of resistant to the 2,4-D. And now 
we have a lot of resistance to 2,4-D. Uh, it, it just doesn't, it's not as effective as it used to be because of this developed resistance to that particular herbicide. But the potential is there for any of them to become resistant. We need to be careful how we manage that. Now we shift over to insects. Um, I, you know, typically healthy turf is not a solution. Um, uh, these insects sometimes actually prefer a healthy turf. You know, they, they'll say, hey, this, this is a good meal. Um, it's important to keep accurate records of past problems. If where you've had some problems, you're probably going to continue to have problems. We need to understand life cycles of the insects. We need to scout for the insects, and we need to custom apply as needed. Uh, my experience, though, is, is if I have a grub problem, I'm probably stuck with it. I'm probably going to have to treat every year. I, just some common insects that we see, uh, we, these, these types of things, um, and it's usually something that has to be treated for pretty regularly uh, on a yearly basis. Um, insect control, it's difficult with chemicals. Um, these insects can reside and attack the roots and crowns, and, and turf grass, by its nature, uh, with some worse than others, will form a thatch layer that kind of is a little bit of a barrier to getting the chemical into where the, the insects are. And so it can be a bit of an issue to get them treated, um, especially if you have a heavy batch. Um, we also have diseases. Um, here are just a few. Uh, we, we get these things and they can, they can wipe you out. Uh, again, I don't see a lot of problems uh, in, in like, well-managed, normal mowing heights, but it, it can it can be a, a problem. I've noticed, for example, in Provo, Utah area, that necrotic ring sprout is really becoming more prevalent where it didn't used to be. Um, I also would note that most of these uh, microbes are beneficial. Um, a lot of what we see out there are actually good. It's, it's nice to have a good, healthy microbial uh, population in the soil. We don't want to kill everything. Um, so applying broad spectrum fungicides is, is somewhat discouraged. It's nice if we have uh, some type of a fungicide that's going to attack specifically what we're, we're going after and not try to just kill everything as a general rule of thumb. I, I would mention the disease triangle. This is, you know, if you've taken a pathology class, you've of course seen this. You have to have a susceptible host, the plant in this case, uh, the, ha the pathogen has to be there, and then the proper environment. If I get all of those things and I get enough time, uh, I can have a disease epidemic that can just wipe me out. Here's, again, I mentioned the necrotic ring spot. Um, this is becoming more and more prevalent. My experience is once you get it, you pretty much have got it, and you're gonna have to treat every year. Um, sometimes you have to treat two or three times, uh, typically at least twice uh, in the spring, um, and sometimes even again in the fall. You have to wait till soil temperatures are correct, follow the label. I, I don't have, there's so many diseases and so many different situations across the, the world. I, I'm not going to delve into all the specifics of every one of these diseases, rather just providing a general overview to be aware of which diseases are in your area and then uh, scout for them and treat them according to label directions. Uh, here's, a, here's a mold, uh, we have pink mold and snow molds uh, that can, can happen. Uh, this is uh, one that, that can be kind of devastating too. Uh, fairy ring is fairly common and very visual, um, especially with if the turf isn't managed really well, you can see this, this turf uh, is a little nitrogen, maybe even sulfur deficient. And you can see these rings here where uh, the, the fairy ring has established and kind of it, it's a, the process that actually greens up the grass, but then in the center, it, as this ring expands, uh, it actually uh, has negative effects in the center of the ring as that ring grows. Now, just some notes of caution. Sometimes, you know, you got to be careful. Here's a sports field that they thought where they were spraying with one thing and they were spraying with Roundup instead. That is a a broad spectrum herbicide that kills everything, including the grass. Uh, this is uh, this is a big problem. I mean, this is an expensive fix. If you want to play football on this field that week, you're going to end up bringing in sod or going somewhere else. 
uh, people can get uh, fired over these things. Um, here's one, even at BYU, uh, I was on top of the stadium looking down on the stadium grass and I happened to look over at our track and I noticed that things were kind of a problem out there in the, in the track, uh, inner, inner part of the track. And sure enough, I found out that somebody had goofed and accidentally sprayed some Roundup where they thought they were spraying something else. So important to be careful. Now, most seriously though, um, these things are dangerous. You know, not only do we have fungi, bacteria, nematodes, I haven't mentioned those, those, are, those can be an issue, uh, insects, weeds. We also have you know, you know, larger organisms such as voles. Uh, these things can just wreak havoc uh, in, in grass. Um, you can get you know, porcupines digging for grubs. I mean, there's, you know, there's some mammals that can be a problem too. Uh, these can also be treated for. But I, I'm, I'm bringing this up because of a real tragedy. Uh, this happened in, in Utah uh, in recent years. Uh, these two little girls died because uh, of not following label directions. Uh, a rodenticide, which is intended to kill rodents, was applied at their home uh, by uh, someone, a pest control company that had been hired. And they applied the chemical too close to the home. Uh, the chemical traveled through the soil and through the walls and ended up killing these little girls, which is just an absolute tragedy. I'm not anti-pesticide, but we need to be careful. We need to realize that some of these things, especially rodenticides are incredibly dangerous. Uh, insecticides affect some of the same uh, body functions as we have and can negatively affect us. The fungicides and the herbicides are relatively less dangerous for humans, but they should be treated with caution as well. We should follow label directions. Um, again, I'm not anti-pesticide, but, but uh, it is important to treat these things with care. <clears throat> I would also say that, that sometimes people just are so uh, ridiculous and not understanding uh, safety. Uh, we, we can, you know, we can think, oh, pes you know, hear the word pesticide. And it's like, oh, you know, that's just horrible. I don't want anything to do with it. But pesticides are part of who we are. I mean, we use pesticides. If you've, if you've taken... Um, you know, you know, medicine for, you know, bacteria infection, that's a pesticide. Um, if it's done right, uh, if they follow the label, these things can be good for us. Uh, if we overdose, we can die uh, or get cancer. So uh, again, they need to be treated with respect, just like everything. Um, even, even fertilizers, you know, uh, they relatively safe, but if you, you know, if you ingested a bunch of urea, you could die. Uh, even water, uh, you, you drink too much water and become overhydrated and die. So it's about the dosage. Uh, it's important to realize that, you know, there's no, no such thing as a chemical that's completely safe. And in our whole world, our bodies are made up of chemicals. Um, you know, so let's not be afraid of chemicals or, you know, or even pesticides. Um, I have a good friend who calls them crop medicines uh, because we seem to like the word medicine better than we like the word pesticide. But you know what? They're, they're similar types of things. And, and again, it's about the dosage. Uh, we need to follow label directions and be cautious, especially people who are working with it. Um, your risk of, of having injury, if, if you're just a consumer, um, you know, the, the, your risk of, from pesticides is pretty low. Uh, if you're working with this stuff day in and day out, your risk has gone up considerably because you're exposed to it more. And so a lot of folks who are listening to this uh, presentation, you're going to be folks who are going to be exposed on a more regular basis to pesticides. Now, that should be something you should be afraid of, but just treat it with caution and respect. Um, it, it's no different than anything else that we need to be uh, in terms of treating things with safety. So I uh, hope you enjoyed this. Uh, thank you very much.